So my background is I grew up in Tulsa. I graduated from Jinx High School. And then I went to Washington University in St. Louis and did an economics major. And then went to University of Michigan and got even colder uh, for medical school. Stayed up in the freezing tundra in Case in Cleveland. And then went to Chicago at Rush University for my spine fellowship. So I focus just on spine surgery now. Um, and I'm excited to be back home in Oklahoma. I've been back for about two years now. And it's nice being home around family and friends and the old stomping grounds. So um, briefly, I'm going to talk about the anatomy of the spine, so kind of everything makes sense once we understand this part. But the anatomy of the spine, it consists of 33 bones that provide us with our body structure. And it pr protects our spinal cord. The main purpose of the spine is to protect our spinal cord. And then we have discs that are located in between the vertebrae, and they act as our uh, shock absorbers. Uh, let's see, these right here. Uh, left handed is hard. And then facet joints are the joints in the back that are kind of like, if you imagine like your elbow or your knee of your spine, they move back and forth and allow motion of the spine through those shock absorbers. So with this, there are certain problems that can happen. Number one is a disc herniation. When a disc herniates, usually we have a ligament around our disc. So this is looking at our spine looking straight down. So this part right here is going to be your belly, the back of your body will be here, it's your left side and your right side, this is the disc here. And this is your spinal cord. What happens is that ligament tears in the back and the disc material, which is a jelly-like material, can come out and hit the nerve and cause pain down your leg. A lot of times, people will initially will come in and say, my back hurts because that ligament's starting to tear. And then once that disc material comes out, that's when you start getting the tremendous leg pain. And there's also disc degeneration. There's different levels of disc degeneration. When people say I have a degenerated disc, there's different levels. It first starts off by having the water content of our disc decrease. So the disc is filled with fluid, and eventually that water content decreases. And as that decreases, the height of the disc begins to get smaller and smaller. Sorry. And as that height decreases, the ligaments in the back of the spine that are normally taut, and as, it's, as it comes down, become pooched out. And that leads to what we call uh, stenosis and bone spur formation. Your body's natural response is to form these bone spurs so that it prevents motion in these arthritic joints and that will cause people pain. So then combination of the bone spurs, the buckling of the ligaments, the disc herniations, all of these pinch our nerves and cause back pain and leg pain. So our initial treatment options are when you come see me, usually I'll probably have you do one of these things first or combination before we get to the last one. Physical therapy or chiropractic manipulation, anti-inflammatory medications, and then possibly epidural injections if it's more of a nerve issue. If it's a nerve issue, sometimes those injections can bathe the nerve and get the inflammation of the nerve down and decrease the pain without having to do any type of surgery at all. So usually uh, for my patients, I, I kind of go through that progression until we get to what we're here to talk about, which is surgery. So in my, in my opinion, there's certain reasons why people need spine surgery, okay? Number one is stenosis or, or pinching of the nerves. And that can lead to radiculopathy, which is pain down your leg in a very specific uh, pattern, uh, depending on what nerve is being hit. I, you can pretty much gauge what the patient's gonna say their pain is. Sciatica is a very good example that people come in, they say, I have sciatic pain. It goes right down the back of my leg. That's usually a nerve pain that comes from the back. There's also a thing called neurogenic claudication, which is the inability to walk long distances. So patients will come in, they'll say, I can walk 200 feet and I gotta stop. And I can walk another 200 feet and I gotta stop. That's because the nerves are being pinched so badly that the muscles don't get enough electric activity to them that they can't continue to function. And then weakness in the legs, which is a later sign of severe stenosis. And you can see in that picture on the left, that's a normal canal. And on the right, with all those things we were talking about, the uh, buckling of the facets and the, uh, the ligaments and the disc herniations, that space starts getting crowded. Also, um, there's instability. Some people have instability of their spine. In other words, the spine shifts forward at one level. And that's because our joints become so arthritic and the way they're oriented as that disc height goes down, those joints go like this and the spine just shifts forward. And when that does, when, th when that occurs, that makes even more stenosis, okay? We call that spondylolisthesis. And then it can also be scoliosis, which is what you see the curvature of the spine. 
And back pain is uh, more of a plus or minus because a lot of times, if it's purely back pain, it's very hard to pinpoint what's causing the pain. It can be the spine, it can be the muscles, it can be the ligaments. It's hard to pinpoint exactly what it is. So back pain, um, we really have to dig in and make sure it's coming from the spine before we do any type of surgeries on it. So my experience has been the patients often come in, I tell them they need surgery and they're terrified. They do not want to have any type of surgery and they've all heard their horror stories of how one person's had surgery and they need multiple, multiple, multiple other surgeries. Um, and while that, sure that's true, there are certain cases where that happens, a lot of times people don't hear about the successes of spine surgery. Um, they, if someone, something happens, you're very apt to tell everybody, but when something good happens, you're, yeah, that's what I was expecting, you know? So oftentimes people don't hear the good stuff, but there are definitely horror stories out there. And some of the thoughts that go through the patient's heads are, is surgery going to make me worse? Will I have to spend a, a ton of time in the hospital? Um, am I going to bleed a lot, have a lot of blood loss or something like that? And what's going to happen to my muscles back there? Am I going to be weaker at the end after this big surgery you're planning? So in our traditional spine surgery, we make a long incision in the back along the midline of the patient's spine, and we retract the muscles out, giving us good exposure of the back bony architecture. And then we do two things. We either do a laminectomy, which is to decompress that tight space, and then if there's instability, then we do a fusion, which is the screws and rods that people hear about. Um, those, are, those are the only two things spine surgeons do. We do laminectomies and we do fusions, basically. Um, but they're done for very specific reasons. So this is the view that I have pretty much every day when I operate, is you're looking down the back of someone's spine. And this is the uh, bone that people often feel on the back of their spine right here. And then it spreads out this way, and the front of the spine is going to be back here, and the disc is here. Normally, when we make our incision, you, know, you can make an incision like this to get to the laminectomy to remove the bone and decompress the nerves. But in order to do the fusion, you need to see this bone and this bone to get our landmarks for our, for our screws, okay? So if you imagine, if I have to make this incision wide, I can't just keep that same length. I have to make it even a longer incision to make it a wider incision, as this shows. And that's where the problem starts happening with traditional open spine surgery. Because the wider I'm making this incision, the longer I'm making it, the more muscle detachment there is, the more muscle retraction there is. And when you retract the muscle for so long, the nerves to the muscles get injured, and the blood supply to the muscle gets injured. And that leads to muscle wasting and longer recovery for the patient. They've actually done studies, it's very interesting, where they show an MRI before and after one of these spine surgeries. You can definitely see the muscle just completely has turned into fat after a spine surgery because you've de-innervated it by holding it out and pulling on it for so long, three hours, four hour surgeries. So in my mind, there's some pros and cons to the traditional spine surgery. One is that you get great exposure. That's for me. I get to see everything very easily. It's wide open. Um, this is what we know how to do. Everyone who's ever done spine surgery has done traditional open spine surgery. And it's reliable. I mean, I know every time I do it, I know exactly what I'm going to see and what I'm going to come across. The cons of it are that the exposure comes with a consequence. You're do when you're getting that large exposure, you're de-innervating the muscle, you're affecting the blood supply. It causes morbidity issues, so people have issues with uh, recovery, and a long post-operative course. Uh, the question is, is there a way to accomplish the same goals of decompressing the nerves and fusing instability with less trauma to the patient? And the answer is yes, and that's through the minimally invasive spine surgery. So the goals are the same. I want to decompress your nerves, and I want to provide stability to the spine. Same as the traditional approach. Um, success to me is getting the same outcome as that traditional approach without compromising quality. So failure is making just a small incision but getting minimal results. So you don't want to do that either. I mean, there's some people out there who do minimally invasive surgery, but they also are minimally effective. So you want to make sure that you're doing what you need to do to achieve those two goals. Um, doing a good MIS surgery requires a different skill set for the surgeon. Um, you have to kind of, you, you'll see in a second what we work through, and you have to appreciate taking um, a look at an entire spine through a very small hole, and also being able to take a two-dimensional x-ray and make it into a three-dimensional thing in your head so that you can work around it. And you rely a lot on tactile feedback. You'll see in a second, there's a probe I put in that I just use, and I can feel your spine, 
and I know exactly kind of where I am as I go up the spine and down the spine, and it helps, and, and I know that feedback. You know, you have to do this long enough, and that, this is where the next point is, that there's a learning curve. You have to do this enough so you can get that feedback and know where you are and not get lost, because a lot of times, people who start doing minimally invasive surgery and they haven't done a lot, they'll put that tube down and then they're completely lost. They have no idea where they are on the spine because everything just looks like one big piece of bone. But you gotta have that feedback to know. So the pros of minimally invasive surgery is that there's less trauma to the patient. You have quicker recovery times. Um, typically you're ambulating that same day after, uh, out of the surgery and you're home about one or two days earlier compared to your traditional surgery because you don't have to heal that big incision. There's a decreased infection rate because there's less open wound, and there's a decreased blood loss, and I don't think I've ever had to transfuse someone yet for, a small, for the MIS surgeries. The cons are, again, it's a harder skill set to master, and the complications, if they do occur, are more, a little more difficult to treat. So no, no, there's no free lunch. So with lumbar decompression, let's talk about some of these procedures. Lumbar decompression is where I'm gonna go in and do the relieve the pressure off the nerves. And I use what's called tubular retractor. So there's little tubes that are about two millimeters or one inch in diameter. Um, and I use a surgical microscope and we bring that tube down and we place it right where we need to on the spine and we focus on just what we need to focus. So in this case, you see a disc herniation here causing stenosis on the nerves here. And we're gonna come and target just that area. We're not gonna open up everything to decompress everything. All we're gonna do is focus on that disc herniation. Um, and it's done as an outpatient. I mean, you come in, we do the surgery, and you're going to go home three or four hours later. So this is me in the operating room. You can tell because of the birthmark on my head right there. Uh, this is our normal incision right here that I would make for a discectomy. And this is the incision that we're making for this procedure. This is that probe I was talking to you about. We make that incision. I put the probe down. I can feel the spine, you can, the spine's shaped like a, they're shingled on top of each other, so you can kind of ride up one and know where you're at. And to confirm it, we don't just do feel, we, we get x-rays, that, that big machine you see here is our x-ray machine. So once I put that right where I want it, I get an x-ray to make sure that's where it is, and we proceed with the surgery then. So that, that's that probe, and then by the time we're done, we put, we, we put sequential probe, uh, tubes over each other. It's kind of one of those like Russian dolls that you open up and there's a smaller one in there. You do one of those with those tubes and by the end you have about a 22 millimeter or 18 millimeter tube that you put in and secure it to the table and that's where we're going to do our, our surgery through. You bring in the surgical microscope to help me look in there and the view again, this is that view again I showed you guys earlier, now it's kind of turned to the side. I'm trying to get to this space here where the disc is and that tube is gonna fit right there. And when we look through the microscope, that's my field of view. And that's all I need to see to get that disc out. A lot of times when we did traditional surgery, you had to come in, detach the muscle, and take the bone off here completely to be able to get to where you need to get to. But now we can do it through that small incision. And this is a view through the actual scope. Um, this is the end of the bone here, this is our ligaments that cover our disc. And then by the time we get done, that bone is gone. Once I remove this ligament, I'm gonna see your nerves and I can move the nerve over and pluck the disc out and we're done. So this is an example of someone's MRI that um, was an actual patient of ours. Uh, this is the disc herniation right here. You can see that knuckle of black coming out. And this is one nerve on one side and the other nerve is getting hit by that disc herniation, okay? So he came in, and, we, and uh, we did the surgery, and now you can see, you can see the nerve on this side, and you can see the nerve on that side. That big chunk of disc that was pressing on it is now gone. And we went through a little area, I lost my little pointer there, right here on the bone. We take this much of the bone off, and then I can move the nerves over and get to that piece of disc. And then the incision is about that big. And, that, and that's a pretty small incision compared to what you would normally have with a big spine surgery. And you can imagine that's why it's easier to recover. That's why I can send you home the same day because you're not stripping the muscle. And I'm not having to worry about um, 
blood loss issues and everything like that that occur with a typical surgery. So that's just a decompression part. We can also do fusion. So when people have instability of their spine, they require a fusion surgery. Um, so for degenerative scoliosis or that slippage of the bone we talked about. And you can see here on this x-ray that the back of this bone and the back of that bone don't line up. It's shifted forward. Okay? Um, so now we can put in our pedicle screws or our screws and rods and a spacer in there to get the fusion. Um, again, through a very small incision, have a blood loss about 50 cc's or 50 ml's, which is normally in this case would be probably about 200 to 300 blood loss type of case. And you're in the hospital about a day or two and you go home. Whereas the traditional one, you're probably in the hospital about three or four days. So I place the, I use some fancy tools like this needle here that we put in the back and we use x-ray to find the uh, pedicle uh, or the bridge of bone connecting the spine and we can put in our screws and then we put in a, a plastic cage like this into the front of the spine to help us with the fusion. And this is what we usually go off of. We, we do everything through x-ray because with the small incision it's very hard to see in there so we rely on our x-ray. This is me putting that needle right at the edge of this circle thing, which is the bridge of bone we're looking for. And then we advance a wire through that, and the wire goes from the back of the spine to the front of the spine. And then we can put our tube down right at that disc space that we need to go to. And by the time we're done, we have two screws in, a rod in, and then that spacer, which is, this is the back of the spacer, this is the front of the spacer. All have been put in, and you can see that you make a couple small incisions there to do all that. Um, again, as opposed to an incision that for that case would have had to have been from about here to here in order to get wide enough just to put those screws in. So why do I like that particular fusion surgery? Again, patients recover faster. It's pretty reproducible so for me it's about two or three hours every time. Um, it helps me plan my day and also um, I know what's coming next. Uh, the patient size doesn't often matter because we're working through those tubes. Um, typically when you have a larger patient, you have to make a larger incision in order to move everything out of the way still. But with these tubes, it's always going to be that same 22 millimeter tube, 26 millimeter tube going down. So the size doesn't matter. Is there movement between the two screws? Is there like movement? All joints there? Yes, or is no, it no, fixed no. Rigid? It's fixed rigid. Okay. And do we, did I notice yeah, because I had to put screws on both sides. Okay. And do you do this in the front of the neck also or the back? Um, sometimes you can do the back of the neck. The front of the neck is already, the, the technique that we have is already pretty minimally invasive, with small incisions. Mm -hmm. um, so th this leads to faster discharge. 80% of the patients are often discharged on day one, the next day after surgery. Um, the rest usually by day two are going home. So another one is an anterior fusion. A lot of these are going to be more about the lumbar spine. But the anterior inner body fusion is you approach the spine from the front. So we have all the muscles in the back, and we don't want to disrupt those at all. So there's a way to approach the spine from the front. Again, we're using an incision about two or three inches long. And the thought process with the inner body fusions of anterior is that, again, remember when the disc space collapses. When the disc space collapses, those ligaments buckle. So if I can get that disc space back up to a normal height, those ligaments will go back to being taut again and can decompress those nerves indirectly. Um, so you don't have to even mess with the nerves in the back. And that's our goal with these anterior inner body fusions. We want to correct any deformities, any scoliosis. We want to correct those disc heights and indirectly decompress the nerves. Usually I have a general surgeon that needs to help me with these because we basically come in around the, the bowel. We don't actually go into the bowel cavity. You, go, you can go around it, right underneath the muscle of, the, of, of your abdomen, pull everything to the side, and get there. And then once you're there, you can take all the disc material out and put a big spacer in there that's to the height that you want, and this will restore that height again. And by the time you're done, a lot, sometimes we also flip the patient and put those screws in, again, through small stab incisions to give added support. But you can, you've, now you can see that we replaced that disc with this spacer in here, and that, which has two screws going up and down. So the advantages of this is you get no disruption in the back muscles. You're not even going near them. 
you get a large area for fusion. The, the, when we take that disc out, we put that big plastic cage in there, the bone fuses through that cage down to the other bone. And when you do it from the front, you have a large footprint for that cage. You can take out a lot of disc material and put a big cage in there and get good fusion. And you're able to restore that disc height and, and allow for that indirect decompression. The disadvantages are that we're going to operate around some pretty vital vessels. Okay? So your aorta and your vena cava, which come down and supply your legs, are right there. That's why you need a general surgeon who comes in. And then a lot of times they can just move those to the side and you're looking right at the disc. But um, it's definitely a little tricky because you, you don't want to injure those. That's, that's a bad day. So in order to, to come up with a different way, people have now devised another way of coming to the spine that allows you to still get that anterior fixation, but going through the side. Now you don't have to deal with the, the, the vessels anymore. You can come in from the side right behind the uh, bowel cavity. So this is your bowel cavity here. And we're going to approach the spine right behind it and go right to that disc from the side. So do you have to come in from both sides then? Mm -mm, just one side. Again, we're going to provide that decompression indirectly because we're going to restore that disc height from the front because we're going to put a big cage in there and restore that disc height and get indirect decompression. And we're going to, we, and we can fix any scoliosis too because when you put those cages in, they're straight. So if a disc is collapsed one way, you put that cage in there, it's going to jack it back up to the right height. Yeah. Talk about restoring the disc height. Yeah. So you're saying that if you've lost one to two inches of height due to your problem with your back, you'll actually gain those back? Uh, you you get, gain some. The problem is one or two inches. That means you've lost many, many, many levels. So we're talking about one or two levels usually with these surgeries. So you'll gain some back, yeah. Okay. And this is how the patient's positioned. I don't know if you can see, but this is the patient's head over here. His arm is draped over over here, and he's laying on his side. His legs will be down this way. We make our incision mark right here, and we make two incisions. One in, in the back where I can put my finger and I can feel the bowel cavities and I can push them aside as I'm guiding my probe down onto the disc space so I don't perforate any bowel or anything like that. And this is us uh, using our wire here to kind of gauge where we are, and then this is that incision I talked about. We can, I put my finger in here. I can push the bowel back. I can feel the back of the muscle. And then I bring that a probe down. Let's see if it works. This probe right here, I can put it down, guided by my finger, onto the disc space to where we need to go to. And then we can put in a retractor like this that moves the muscle and everything out of the way. And then put a cage like that sorry, a cage like this, through that retractor into that disc space and open that disc space up again. So that becomes permanent then? Mm -hmm. What's the life expectancy of that cage? For Whatever yours is. <laughs> I mean, it's a... Yeah, I mean, it'll go with you to the grave. Because it's, it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a bearing surface, okay? So like when people have hips and knees, those things are moving and they wear out. This, we're hoping that it doesn't move anywhere. So it's just going to sit there and just keep that height open. And this is the result. So you get two incisions, one up here, about a couple inches, and one back here, uh, about an inch or so. And we can put, this is that cage. So we can put the, the cage, this is looking at it straight on. And you can take it, someone that looks like this with a curve in their spine, come in from the side here and put those cages in one by one and build them back up. To, it's just one screw. Uh, this one has four screws. This one, this one, this one, this one, and a rod. There's three cages. Yeah. Yeah. But you can really open up those spaces. See how it's collapsed over here? And then when you put that cage in, the cage is, is parallel. So it's going to make whatever it goes into parallel. And then you can build it right up. The problem with this one is you can't get to uh, the very lowest level, the L5, S1 level, because your pelvis is in the way. I can't go through that bone. So I can, we can do usually from 4, 5, 3, 4, 2, 3, and up. Um, the 5, 1 level, we usually would go from the front again. So sometimes people come in with a big curve. You go in from the front, do that one, put them on their side, do those other ones, and then you can build them up um, very nicely. 
Um, people are doing it in the thoracic spine. Um, no, because the neck, you can't come in from the side. The neck, we kind of come in from between the muscles. It's, we have a, a safer plane between the muscles of the neck that we can just move out. You don't have to even mess with anything and go there. Um, so in conclusion, with minimally invasive spine surgery, I think it's now a very safe and effective way and alternative way to do things. I think um, the technology has allowed us to do much broader cases in a much more less traumatic way. And patients have good results. They have less length of stay, less complications, and earlier recovery um, of their issues. And you know, a lot of times I tell people this, if you don't really believe this is the future, when was the last time you heard of someone having an open gallbladder removal or open appendix removal? No one does that anymore because it's, it doesn't make sense. And so a lot of times you know, people are, resist the changes, but when you start thinking about it, we've become very minimally invasive. Many other aspects of medicine, we're, we're just kind of lagging behind in spine surgery. So that's it. Let me know if you have any questions. When you put those cages in and you fuse two together, yeah. how much of your mobility do you lose? I mean, yeah, I your spine, it moves up so you can bend over. Sure, but, you, but most of your bending is through your hips. Okay. So you can get someone who's fused top down. People who have scoliosis surgeries, and they can still bend down and get their stuff, but they'll just bend with a good posture. You know? You're going to make you sit up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Traditional back surgeries, you talked about, what percentage end up with some kind of complication? Now that you, you talked about switching to invasive surgery, how, what percentage end up with complication? I think the percentage are the same because you're doing the same things. Um, in fact, I would say probably less than 5% of people have some sort of complication, okay. whether it be infection, nerve injury, um, inability to fuse the bone, um, need for further surgery for some reason, hardware failure. Um, minimally invasive is probably about the same once you get good at it. I think when people first start off doing it, the, those risks are a little higher. And it's hard for you guys to know who's who with that. But um, yeah, I think you know, we're, you gotta go some places you, that the person's been trained doing this. And when I was in Chicago, that's pretty much all we did for a year was this type of surgery under some of the guys who invented this procedure, these uh, procedures. Uh, since I've been here, I think 300 or so. There's not a really good way right now. And the reason why for minimally invasive is because your lungs are there. Okay. It's, hard to get, it's hard to get around the lungs um, up there. Um, so we don't really have a good minimally invasive technique there. Some people do. Some people take the rib down, mm -hmm. a portion of the rib down. They can put it, uh, that same lateral okay. weight down there. Um, I'm, I just haven't seen enough good results to want to do that yet. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, if you have uh, peripheral neuropathy caused from compression in the lumbar region and, and you fix the problem with the compression, can you arrest the, uh, the spread of the, or the progression of the neuropathy? Oftentimes, yes. But, they say that numbness and weakness takes the longest to recover, and it recovers about a millimeter a day. So if you're being compressed in your spine and your toes are numb, it may take a while for those nerves to get a millimeter a day. They can actually get better, though. Sometimes, yeah. It depends on if that's the only source. Sometimes people have diabetic neuropathy, too. Yeah. That's complicating the picture, and they may not about that. When they say spinal stenosis, the cervical region. Sure. That means all of the discs are starting to. Not necessarily. Change. Depends on which you know. Sometimes they'll say C4-5 stenosis or C5-6 stenosis. Yeah. Uh, with the herniated disc, you say you remove a portion of the bone and then you open the ligament so that you can see. Yeah. How do you repair the ligament and do you do anything with that missing portion of the bone? Uh, the, the missing portion of the bone is very small, so no, you don't you don't do it anything with that. Uh, the muscle just covers it right back up. So you don't really